Greetings, it's Alex Scher for the Shelburne Freelancer. I'm at the Shelburne Fall Fair with a man who has a display going in a very unique profession. I'm here today with... Hello, I'm Jeff Raycraft. And uh, can you tell a little bit about your profession? Absolutely, what we're doing here is I'm a blacksmith, uh, or should be formerly a blacksmith. My trade is actually a farrier. And a farrier is a blacksmith that specializes in shoeing horses. Right. But today we're doing a demonstration on just the, the fine lost art of blacksmithing to help with the fair. So right now we're just in a coal forge. This is just an old portable coal forge with a set of crank bellows here. What I'm doing now is I'm heating up just a piece of bar stock. And if you think of it, I make the coal uh, somewhat like a igloo, but made of coal and it makes a little oven. So as the fire gets a little warmer, I've just started it. So it's just starting to form now. And as I take my steel, I then enter it back into my oven, a little coal igloo, and it helps speed up the heating effect. The more I crank, the hotter my fire will get. But since this is a portable forge, if I get it going too hot, I'll start burning my whole uh, bounty of coal here. So once I get to a, a decent heat, which I'm just about there, I'm going to bring it over to my anvil. And what I'm doing is I'm penciling this steel, and then I'm going to make some scroll, which is kind of like a, the trademark blacksmith. Every piece of wrought iron has a little scroll or a twist at the end of it. So we're going to warm up with something like that just to, to wake myself up as well. If somebody wanted to get in touch with you and ask you to do any kind of service for them, how would they reach you? They can contact the Shelburne Fair. They have all my information. Okay. This is incredible. Just going to bring it over to the anvil here now. So. How many years have you been doing this? I've been doing this for 22 years. I started right out of high school. Right now I'm just finding this tip here. I have to concentrate a little bit or I'll wreck all my work here. Uh, what you see here, this is the slag that comes off the steel as I heat it and uh, hit it with my hammer. So I'm just getting to the nitty gritty here. As I'm striking, every now and then you'll hear, hear that tap. What that tap does, it releases my grip so it lessens the effects of carpal tunnel. The more I squeeze that hammer, uh, the more tense my forearm gets. So you always you always hear a blacksmith. And he's also keeping a rhythm as he's doing that. When you're working in a pair of a striker and a blacksmith, there'll be a striker on the opposite side. And you'll hear a rhythm like this. And that's a signal to the other striker when to hit it. When he, I strike the anvil, boom, he strikes the steel. Strike. Strike. Means stop. So there's a bit of a rhythm to it. But with a, a single blacksmith hammering, when you see him do that, he's just releasing his grip to uh, just to relax his forearm for a second. Actually, while well, I'm doing that, the beauty too, when you're striking, a good anvil has a bounce just like that. That's just dropping the hammer. Wow. So over here, so all part of that bounce is, I'll say, is the, the heart of the anvil right here. Over here where there's no metal, there's no bounce and it's dead. If you were to pound on this side all day, you would uh, really wreck your arm. But over here, so there's the same drop. It bounces right back into my hand. I like that part. That's great. <laughs> so how busy are you? It seems like that profession is... You, you hardly hear about that today, well, actually, a blacksmith. The, the blacksmithing part is more of an artistic flair now. Um, there's several, I'm from the north area near Muskoka. There's several blacksmiths up there that do art, artistic work. Um, more so now, the blacksmith is basically the farrier. And again, that's the farrier is a gentleman that's spe a blacksmith specializing in shoeing horses. And as we mentioned earlier in our conversation, there's more horses now uh, than when we needed horses for transportation or for work. So there is quite a number of full-time farriers out there. And uh, there's, there's more horses uh, than you can 
keep track of. There's so much work. If you like to, if you like animals and you're a country kind of fella, or lady, um, blacksmithing or barrier work, there's, there's always going to be work for it. Did you go to school for this? Believe it or not, I did. I went to Seneca College oh. in, uh, in the King Campus in 1993. And it was an introduction to blacksmith, uh, specializing in farrier science. Interesting. And uh, the course with that, for a second. The course, um, it was a year course, and uh, they call it farrier science because we learn basically from the shoulder and hip down of the horse um, the anatomy, so we can parlay with a veterinarian if the horse is lame or injured. We can work together and come up with a solution to help that animal. Best for the animal and best for the owner. Huh. And uh, so we learn all the anatomy down, so we're not talking about the thingamadoody and the, the doohickey on the horse. We, we know the technical terms to that. Uh, again, it's a, it's a broad range even for a, a veterinarian to learn. Uh, they're not specialized in shoeing horses. So having a blacksmith now as a profession, as a farrier, uh, helps the, you have to have a great working relationship with the vet, which most do, because uh, we both help each other out. So I'm gonna strike on this a little bit more. Remove some of that slag. You don't remove the slag, that's what flies up and hits you on your face. Safety first. So we're getting to the fine tune in here. Go back to my forge here. If I was shoeing horses today, I wouldn't bring this portable forge with me. I have a propane firebox, we'll say. It's a a small size barbecue, if you will, and it's faster heat. It's not as quality as a heat as a coal forge, but it's a fast heat, and it allows me to modify and change uh, the shape of the shoe on site with the horses themselves. Sounds pretty modern. Very modern. There's no chimney snicking out of my truck for a, for a forge. It's a, a modern day little propane uh, box, and we, uh, we modify each shoe fit the horse. They come in a compromise type pattern and we modify them. To, uh, it's a custom shoe for that horse each, each time. So as I get down to the end here I gotta pay more attention because I can really mess up all my hard work here. How much does a horseshoe cost to make nowadays, as compared to the old days? Oh, geez, I, I wouldn't know what it cost back in the day, but the bar stock, um, you can buy a lot of bar stock for a hundred dollars. It has, you have to have enough elbow grease to keep pounding out of it. But a lot of the, the shoes that we buy as farriers are already a pre-made compromised shape. Oh. And then we modify them to fit the horse. In some cases we do have to start from scratch and make that shoe to uh, for custom fit or a special need. Corrective shoeing they call that. I had no idea every horse was so different. They I have a it was similar a shape, but just like ourselves, we all had different shapes and sizes of feet. Oh. And uh, almost like uh, orthotics in a way. Right. Basically, there's no magic to a shoe. It's just... Uh, applying and relieving pressure, depending on what type of shoe we're using. They provide traction, protection, and that's about it. There's no magic behind it. They are still put on the same way they were put on back in the day. So could a horse get injured wearing the wrong shoe? Absolutely. A poor fitted, uh, fitted shoe is no different than if uh, we had a poor fitting shoe. Uh, you wouldn't want to be walking on it. And in some cases, um, I'm just, sorry, I'm just concentrating on my pencil here, sorry. Um, in some cases, if 
that the blacksmith isn't uh, paying attention to to maybe the special need of the horse, um, putting it on improper can actually harm the horse. Putting pressure in the wrong spots and they can get bruises. Um, they can be very sore. So there's always a term called corrective shoeing. I threw that out already. But it's actually, if you just did correct shoeing, there would be no need for corrective shoeing. Um, when you're working hand in hand with a vet, and if there's a lameness on a horse, especially show horses that come up lame, especially in August, um, we work together as a team to, to come up with the best fitting shoe, uh, and the most supportive shoe for that horse and whatever it's doing through the show season. Well, this has been very informative. I thank you very much for this. My pleasure. This is Alex Scher for the Shelburne Freelancer, sharing Shelburne with the world.